Cases of Conscience, William Perkins. What must a man do that he may come into God's favor and be saved? For answer to this question, some grounds must be laid down beforehand. The first is this, that we must consider and remember how and by what means God brings any man to salvation. For look how God saveth others. So he that would know how to be saved must use the means whereby God saveth them. Section 1. In the working and effecting of man's salvation, ordinarily there are two special actions of God, the giving of the first grace, and after that the giving of the second. The former of these two works has ten several actions. God gives man the outward means of salvation, especially the ministry of the word, and with it he sends some outward or inward cross to break and subdue the stubbornness of our nature, that it may be made pliable to the will of God. This we may see in the example of the jailer, Acts 16, and of the Jews that were converted at Peter's sermon, Acts 2. Number 2. This done, God brings the mind of man to a consideration of the law, and therein generally to see what is good and what is evil, what is sin and what is not sin. Number three, upon a serious consideration of the law, he makes a man particularly to see and know his own peculiar and proper sins, whereby he offends God. Number four, upon the sight of sin, he smites the heart with a legal fear, and whereby when man seeth his sins, he makes him to fear punishment in hell and to despair of salvation in regard of anything in himself. Now these four actions are indeed no fruits of grace, for a reprobate may go thus far, but they are only works of preparation going before grace. And other actions which follow are effects of grace. Number five. The fifth action of grace, therefore, is to stir up the mind to a serious consideration of the promise of salvation propounded and published in the gospel. Number six. After this, the sixth is to kindle in the heart some seeds or sparks of faith, that is, a will and desire to believe, and grace to strive against doubting and despair. Now at the same instant, when God begins to kindle in the heart any sparks of faith, then also he justifies the sinner, and withal begins a work of sanctification. Number seven, then so soon as faith is put into the heart, there is presently a combat, for it fighteth with doubting, despair, and distrust. And in this combat, faith shows itself by fervent, constant, and earnest invocations for pardon. And after invocation follows the strength and prevailing of this desire. Number eight. Furthermore, God in mercy quiets and settles the conscience as touching the salvation of the soul and the promise of life whereupon it resteth and stayeth itself. Number nine. Next after this settled assurance and persuasion of mercy follows the stirring up of the heart to evangelical sorrow according to God. That is, a grief for sin because it is sin and because God is offended. And then the Lord works repentance whereby the sanctified heart turns itself unto him. And though this repentance be one of the last in order, yet it shows itself first, as when a candle is brought into a room. We first see the light before we see the candle, and yet the candle must needs be before the light can be. Number ten. Lastly, God gives a man grace to endeavor to obey his commandments by a new obedience, and by these degrees doth the Lord give the first grace. The second work of God tending to salvation is the giving of the second grace, which is nothing else but the continuance of the first grace given. For look as by creation God gave a being to man and all other creatures, and then by his providence continued the same being, which was as it were a second creation. So in bringing a man to salvation, God gives the first grace, for example, to believe and repent, and then in mercy give the second to persevere and continue in faith and repentance to the end. And this, if we regard man himself, is very necessary.
For as fire without supply of manner, whereby it is fed and continued, would soon go out. So, so unless God of his goodness should follow his children and by new and daily supplies continue his first grace in them, they would undoubtedly soon lose the same and finally fall away. The second ground for the answer of this question is taken from some special places of Scripture, where the same is moved and resolved. The men that were at Peter's sermon be in touch with the sense of their own misery upon the doctrine which had been delivered, as the Holy Ghost saith, were pricked in their hearts and cried one to another, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter, moved by the Spirit of God, answered them, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. The like was the case of the jailer who, after that stubbornness of his heart was beaten down by fear of the departure of the prisoners, he came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and moved this question unto them. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? To whom they gave answer, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved in thine household. The young man in the gospel sues to Christ, and asks him, What shall I do to be saved? Christ answers, Keep the commandments. When he replied that he had kept them from his youth, Christ tells him that he must go yet further and sell all that he hath, and give to the poor. And John tells the scribes and Pharisees, who came unto his baptism and confessed their sins, that if they would flee from the wrath to come, they must repent and bring forth fruits worthy amendment of life. From these places, then, I frame this answer to the question in hand. The man that would stand in the favor of God and be saved must do four things. First, humble himself before God. Secondly, believe in Christ. Thirdly, repent of his sins. Fourthly, perform new obedience unto God. Section 2. For the first, humiliation is indeed a fruit of faith, yet I put it in place before faith, because in practice it is first. Faith lieth hid in the heart, and the first effect whereby it appears is the abasing and humbling of ourselves. And here we are further to consider three points. First, wherein stands humiliation. Secondly, the excellence of it. Thirdly, the questions of conscience that concern it. Touching the first point, humiliation stands in the practice of three things. The first is a sorrow of heart, whereby the sinner is displeased with himself and ashamed in respect of his sins. The second is a confession to God, wherein also three things are to be done. First, to acknowledge all our main sins, original and actual. Secondly, to acknowledge our guiltiness before God. Thirdly, to acknowledge our just damnation for sin. The third thing in humiliation is supplication made to God for mercy, as earnestly as in a manner of life and death. And of these three things we have in the scriptures, the examples of Ezra, Daniel, and the prodigal son. The second point is the excellency of humiliation, which stands in this, that it, that it hath the promises of life eternal annexed to it. Isaiah 57:15. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to give life to them that are of a contrite heart. Psalm 51, 17, A contrite and a broken heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Proverbs 28, 13, He that hideth his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall find mercy. 1 John 1, 9, If we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. By all these and many other places, it is manifested in the very instant when a sinner begins truly in his heart and conscience to humble himself, he is then entered into a state of salvation. So soon as David said, I have sinned, 
Nathan pronounces in the name of the Lord that his sins were put away. And David himself said, alluding to the former place, I said, I will confess my sin. And lo, thou forgavest the wickedness of my sin. When the prodigal son had but said, I will go to my father, and so on, even then before he humbled himself, his father meets him and receives him. The third point is touching the questions of conscience concerning humiliation, all which may be reduced to four principal cases. Number one case. What if it fall out that a man in humbling himself cannot call to mind either all or the most of his sins? I answer, a particular humiliation indeed is required for main and known sins, but yet there are two cases wherein general repentance will be accepted of God for unknown sins.